beginning church and our online family and friends. Thank you once again for tuning in to our station on Facebook and on Zoom. God is such an awesome God and he deserves all the glory, all the honor that is due his name. Our scripture for tonight is Revelations 4 and 11 and it reads, you are worthy, O Lord our God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and they exist because you created what you pleased. This scripture tells us that God is worthy and why God is worthy to receive glory, honor, and praise. Why is he worthy? Because he created all things, and they only exist because he, God, created what he wanted to create. We serve an awesome God, a God who has the power to do what he says he's going to do, and he will do that. Our song today is, You Deserve the Glory and the Honor. For you are great, you do miracles so great, there is no one else like you. And I just thank God and praise him because there's no one else like God. Help us sing. <clears throat> you deserve the glory. As we lift your holy name, you deserve the glory and the honor. Lord, we lift our hands in worship as we lift your holy name. You are great. You do miracles so great. There is no
Father God in heaven, in the name of Jesus the Christ, we come. God, we thank you for another privilege. God, we thank you for another honor. We thank you for another grand opportunity to come before you tonight, Lord. We thank you for blessing us and keeping us. We thank you for blessing us, Father God, to magnify you. God, we thank you, Father God, for another privilege to breathe. Yes. for another heartbeat, yes. for another chance, Lord. Lord, we realize, Father God, that you are God, yes. and you are God alone. You blessed us in spite of us. You blessed us, Father God, and we don't deserve it. Yes. You've given us another opportunity to praise your name. And for that, God, we are thankful. We bless you today. We magnify you. We glorify you, Lord. We lift you up, Father God. We make you big before the world that every person in the world will see you. We thank you, Lord, for who you are, for what you do, for the way you do things, Father God. We thank you now, Father God, for blessing us through your word. We come now tonight, Lord, asking you to forgive us for our sins, that we will hear your word, that we will obey your word, that we will be led by your word. We thank you, Father God, for another chance to study your word. It's in the name of Jesus the Christ we pray, and we ask it all. Amen, and thank God. Let me say thank you to those who are joining us by Zoom, as well as joining us uh, by uh, Facebook Live. Thank you so much for being a part of our service here. Again, at the New Beginning Church at our remote location, one more time. Thank you so much. I promised you on last setting that we will begin in the book of Colossians tonight. And so we will begin in the book of Colossians. Tonight will be our overview, will be our introduction. So we will cover only the first two verses in the book of Colossians. The first two verses, Colossians chapter 1, is where we will be covering tonight. Chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. We'll be looking at Colossians chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. Uh, we will be covering that introduction, and I'm going to give you some background in those two verses, and I'm going to let you go for tonight. But you do know that the Word of God is so exhausted, you can't just do it in 10, 15 minutes, even if it's an introduction. First of all, when we look at the book of Colossians, there is some debate going on <clears throat> during this time, and, and these debates are going on as it deals with who is the right one to follow, as well as what doctrine is the right doctrine to follow. Here we find the Apostle Paul, along with Timothy, Apostle Paul is given credit for writing the book of Colossian, of Colossia. Now, this book of Colossians was written by the Apostle Paul. He is called an apostle. <clears throat> Paul, who was once Saul, is called an apostle. Of course, he was not an apostle, as Peter, James, and John, and the 12 disciples as a whole were, but he was the apostle, as he says, out of due season. <clears throat> so the apostle Paul is the author here. He is an apostle out of due season. This word apostle means a messenger, a spokesman of the Lord who has been anointed by the Lord, that's called by the Lord to, uh, to present God's word. Now, this word apostle was given to one who was setting up churches, one who was deal dealing with the early church and making sure that the early church was set up based on the right doctrine, the right Christian doctrine. So we find the apostle Paul here as the author. So when you take your notes, and I know you all have notes, we're starting a brand new series. You ought to have notes before you so you can take notes so you can learn the, the book of Colossians as, as we go through it. Paul, the apostle, is the author. He is the writer. He is writing based on God's word as God's word is delivered unto him. So the apostle Paul is the writer here. He is the messenger, God's spokesman. He is delivering a message to the church at Colossae. He is delivering the message to the church at Colossae. He is delivering this message, letting the church of Colossae know, don't be given over to false doctrine. 
So it was written, it was written, uh, theologians believe that it was written A.D. 60 to A.D. 64. This book of Colossians was written between the years of A.D. 60 to A.D. 64, written to the church at Colossae. I want to talk about the key passages that I have deemed as key passages as you will find them in the book of Colossae. We will deal with some key passages. The first key passage is found in Colossians chapter 1, verses 8 through 16. Colossians chapter 1, verses 8 through 16. It, these are key passages. These are passages that are key. The second passage that you will find in the book of Colossians is Colossians chapter 2, verses 20 through 23. Colossians chapter 2, verses 20 through 23. And the third key passage or key verse that I've found in the book of Colossians is Colossians chapter 3, verse number 5. Colossians chapter 3, verse number 5. Let me cover those three passages again. The first key passage that you will find in Colossians that I deem as key passages, number one is Colossians chapter 1, verses 8 through 16. <clears throat> Colossians chapter 1, verses 8 through 16, with verse, verse, verse 8 and verse 15 being very key here. The second passage or pericope that I have deemed as a key passage is Colossians chapter 2, verses 20 through 23. Key passages are those key passages that we will talk about as we go across them as we cover the book of Colossians. The third key verse that I found, the third key verse is Colossians chapter 3, verse number 5. Colossians chapter 3, verse number 5. Colossians chapter 3, verse number 5. <clears throat> so these are key passages. The primary theme of the book of Colossians, the primary theme, that theme that we deem as important, that theme that is a common thread that runs through the book of Colossians, the primary theme is Jesus is deity. Jesus is deity. The second point that we bring out as, key, as a key theme is Jesus is supreme to all. Jesus Christ is deity. He is God. The second thing is Jesus is supreme to everything and everybody. And the book of Colossians will show us that as we move forward. The third uh, theme that we see running throughout this book of Colossians is God's fullness is in Jesus Christ. The fullness of God is found in Jesus Christ. God's fullness, the fullness of God is found in Jesus Christ himself. The other theme that runs throughout, throughout this entire chapter and throughout this entire, entire book is that Jesus Christ is the head of all power and all principalities. Jesus Christ is the head of all powers and all principalities. We know that Satan the devil is the prince of this world, but he has not and will not supersede Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the head of all power and all principalities. Paul says in Ephesians that we are in a great warfare. There's a war going on. And as we understand that there's a war going on, one thing we must understand very, very clearly that our general that gives us our marching orders is Jesus Christ himself. He is the head of all power and all principalities. Jesus Christ mm -hmm. in the book of Colossians will point that out as we move through it. The final point is, and there are many other points to be brought out, but my final point for the primary theme of the book of Colossians is the fact that Jesus Christ gives us the face of God. When we look at the visible image of Jesus Christ, he gives us an opportunity 
to look into the face of God. For Jesus Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. So Jesus Christ allows us to look into the face of God. We know that no man can look at look into the face of God lest he dies. Therefore, God has given us a chance to take a glimpse into his face through Jesus Christ. Paul would point these key verses, key themes out throughout, throughout this, this particular book of Colossians. The primary purpose of Paul's writing the book of Colossians, there's a primary purpose. There's, there are primary purposes, the reason why he wrote this. First of all, he wanted to lead believers away from false doctrine and doctrinal heresies. Paul wanted to lead believers away from false doctrine and doctrinal heresies. The word heresy here means false, false doctrine. The word heresy is spelled H-E-R-E-S-Y, heresy, H-E-R-E-S-Y. So Paul wanted to lead these new Christians away from false doctrine and doctrinal heresies. He wanted to lead them away from that because they were getting caught up in these false doctrines. I'm going to point out three of those doctrines that they, got, they were caught up in. Gnosticism, it's spelled with a G. It's spelled G-N-O-S-T, G-N-O-X-T-I-C-I-S-M. They were getting caught up in Gnosticism. Then they were getting caught up in mysticism. Mysticism, it's spelled M-Y-S-T-I-C-I-S-M. M Y S T I C I S M. They were getting caught up in mysticism. The third thing they were getting caught up in was Judaism. Judaism. They were getting caught up in the old pattern, the old way of Judaism. Judaism is J U D A I S M. J U D. A-I-S-M. They were getting caught up in Judaism. So Paul writes the book of Colossians so they could get away from these three major thought patterns, these three major religions, and turn them back again to Christianity. They were born through Christ Jesus, but because of the false doctrine that was being taught, they were getting caught up in these false doctrines. And as they were getting caught up in these false doctrines, Paul writes this letter to them. There's a conflict on, on whether he was still in prison or whether he was out of prison. Regardless of where he was, the Apostle Paul is trying to make sure they get a good understanding that Christianity is the way to salvation. Christianity through Jesus Christ is the only way to God. Yes. So he paints this picture Throughout the book of Colossians, he paints the picture that Jesus Christ is the only way. I told you that he says to us today, by way of the book of Colossians, that Jesus Christ puts us face to face with God. He shows us God when we look at him. Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ had, Jesus Christ is what, what's called the hyperstatic union. He is just as much God as God and just as much man as man. He has what is known as the hyperstatic union. Hyperstatic union. Hyperstatic union. This hyperstatic union found in Jesus Christ, he's the only God man. He's not the only man of God. He's the only God man. He is God and man in one. He is God and man in one. Jesus Christ, except we know him, we don't get to know God. Except we receive him, we don't get to see God. Yes. Except we know him in the departing of our sins, we will never get to heaven where God is. Mm -hmm. It is through Jesus Christ and Jesus alone, the only way we can get to heaven. 
And the only way we can really, really, really see who God is, is through Jesus. I told you the first thing that Paul is fighting against is Gnosticism. So the people who did this, the people who studied this, the people who act out this way, the people who followed this doctrine are called Gnosticists. G-N-O-S-T-I-C-S. These Gnosticists, they believe, they believe that the evil creator God, the evil creator, God himself, he and his angels caused ignorance and confusion. These Gnosticists, they believe, they believe that God, even though they trusted God, even though they believed in God, they believe that God and his angels caused all the confusion that we have and caused all the ignorance that we see. They believe God on one hand and his angels got together and in the process of them getting together, they caused confusion and they caused ignorance. Because they have concluded that a good God would not allow all these confusing things to happen. If he's really God, if he's God like he say he is, he wouldn't allow these things to happen. Just like some men would say, a good God wouldn't send you to hell. You're right, he gives you a chance to go to heaven. <laughs> Many have said, if God is such a loving God, if he's such an awesome God, if he's such a great God, why would he send somebody to hell? Well, I say to you today, except you receive Jesus Christ, you're going to hell. And it's not God's fault. It's our fault if we choose not the Christ way, the God-like way. So Noctisists have come to the conclusion that God was not the supreme one because he wouldn't let this happen. God is not the deity. Matter of fact, he is a lesser God. So, so Paul is writing this letter to fight against these Noxicists. He's, he's fighting against Noxicism. He's fighting against them because they believe that this thing that we call God is really not the God with the capital G God. He is a, a Lord G God. He is a lesser God, and this lesser God enables us to go through confusion and go through ignorance. Mm -hmm. So Paul writes this letter to Colossians to let them know that uh, we got to make sure that we stick to Christianity and don't give in to Noxicists. Then he, he writes this letter to fight against mysticism. The mysticist, the mysticist is spelled M-Y-S-T-I-C-S. -S. The mysticist, the mysticist believe religious experience, religious experiences through, through rites, through legends, through ethics, through myths, and through magic. That's how they become spiritual. Mysticists. You ever heard a person say, he just mystifying? That person, what they're saying is this person has gotten caught up in a religious experience. And this religious experience that comes through magic, that comes through ethics, that comes through rites, that comes through these legends and myths, along with magic, these things are the way you become holy. These things are the way you become spiritual. Paul is fighting against these things in the book of Colossians. Paul is saying, saying to us today, don't be, believe like the mysticists. The mysticists believe that spirituality is achieved by sitting and thinking. It, by, 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 by sitting. You, you always hear people talking about how I just sit and I think. And I sit and I just mystify. Mm -hmm. And all my troubles go away and I'm spiritual because I sit and I think. They, they just sit there and they think and some of them chant because they're mystics. They are practicing mysticism. The third thing that Paul has to fight against, uh, he has to tell the church of Colossians, Colossae, 
what you need to do is stick, stick to Christianity because Judaism is still alive and well. Judaisms, those who were, were Judaizers, they believed in the Jewish rules. And they believe you got to have all these rules together and all these rules come together to make you spiritual. There are some people today that believe I got to follow X, Y, Z rules. Yes, there must be some structure. Yes, you must follow rules and regulations everywhere you go. It would be so nice if our youth and our young people would learn to follow rules. <laughs> you got to learn to follow rules everywhere you go. But the fact of the matter is they were so caught up in yesteryear, so caught up in the traditions, so caught up in Judaism until they, they turned their backs on Christianity. These Jewish rules, like, like they, they met through tradition. They did things through tradition. They, they did their religious rituals. They did their religious prayers. Let me just tell you, prayer should not be a ritual to you. Prayer should be a custom for you. Prayer should be done regularly and often. Matter of fact, the psalmist says that you ought to rise early in the morning and get with the Lord. And I want to let you know, you ought to go, go to bed at night getting with the Lord. You ought to spend your time along with the Lord. But those who were in the midst of Judaism, they could only get past, a step past what their ancestors used to do. They couldn't follow Christianity all the way. They, they got caught up in rituals. They, they got caught up in prayers. They got come up, caught up in ethical actions. Mm -hmm. They also had a problem because they rejected God in human form. They rejected God in human form. They didn't believe in this hyperstatic union we talked about. They didn't believe that God who sits in heaven also became God on planet earth. They didn't believe that Jesus Christ in human form is God and was God. This, the, these who follow Judaism, they rejected God in human form. Let me just share with you. Jesus Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. He is God in human form. So Christianity... <laughs> To the, to the church at Colossae, was, this word was written to them to make sure they held on to Christianity. Now, those of us who are Christians, we believe in, we believe in the triune God. Key word here is tri, triune, triune God. We believe in God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. We believe that God is one person manifested in three persons. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Re look, look at what I said. I said God is one God manifested in three persons, three personalities, three different forms. But check this out. God is never a it. So you can't say God the Holy Spirit it. God, the Holy Spirit, he. So we believe in the triune God. He is one person being manifested in three different persons. And one of those persons is Jesus Christ, and he became human. God, the Father, God, the Son, God, the Holy Spirit, the second person of the triune God, the second person of the Trinity, Jesus himself became Jesus himself became man. He became God in the flesh. That's why I always tell people, you have no reason to say the Holy Spirit hit me because the Holy Spirit is a person. The Holy Spirit is a personality. The Holy Spirit is an intelligent being. The Holy Spirit doesn't hit you. He lives and resides and dwells in you. The Holy Spirit himself is the third person of the triune God. This third person of the triune God, the Holy Spirit himself, he doesn't hit us. He comes into us and he dwells in us. He walks with us. 
That's what the old saints used to sing about. They say, he walks with me. He talks with me. He tells me that I am his own. He, the Holy Spirit, the triune God, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. They are one. They are God. We see Jesus in Christianity. We see Jesus as our redeemer. We see Jesus as our reconciler. We see Jesus as our redeemer. Jesus has paid the price. He has bought us back. He has paid the price with his blood on Calvary. We see Jesus Christ in Christianity as our redeemer. He has bought us back. And not only did he buy us back, he has also brought us back. He bought us back. He bought us back. He paid the price on a skull hill called Calvary. He gave his very life for you and for me that he purchased us with his precious blood. He is our redeemer. He redeemed us by the precious blood that he shed on Calvary. Not only is he our redeemer, he's our reconciler. We were at odds with God. <laughs> I had a problem, God had a problem. God's problem was with me and my problem was with God. But because of Jesus' death on Calvary and his resurrection early that third day morning, he reconciled us. He brought us together. You see what Jesus did, he reached up and caught the holy hand of God. He reached down and caught the unholy hand of man. And on Calvary, when he died, he reconciled us. He brought us together as one. Mm -hmm. He brought us together. He, he reconciled us. He put our bitter disputes away. He reconciled us. And the only way to be reconciled back to God is to admit to God, God, I was wrong and you were right. The only way to get back to God, the only way to be reconciled to God is to admit to God, God, I messed up. God, I've fallen short. God, I've not done the things that are pleasing in your sight. God, I have sinned again. Jesus Christ is our reconciler. He brought a bitter dispute to a happy ending. He brought us back together. He, he's our redeemer. He, he brought us back. He's our reconciler. He brought us back. He brought us back to God. Jesus in Christianity has a divine nature. In Christianity, Jesus has a divine, a holy nature, a holy nature. He is the divine one himself. He's God all by himself. Mm -hmm. He is Jesus. And, and finally, he Jesus in Christianity, Jesus is the incarnate Christ. The word incarnate or incarnate or incarnation. He is the incarnation of God himself. This word incarnation is I-N-C-A-R-N-A-T-I-O-N. I-N-C-A-R-N-A-T-I-O-N. He is the incarnation. That means that he, he was carnated. He is the incarnate God. He, he is the physical specimen of God that we can see. He is the incarnation. I didn't say reincarnation because as Christians, we don't believe in reincarnation. We don't believe when a man dies, he come back as a dog or a frog or a snake. We just know that the God we serve, Jesus is the incarnation of him. He is the one on planet earth who represents God in heaven. He is the physical body of God. He's the incarnation. So let's look at Colossians chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. This is our introduction tonight. When you find it, you will see Paul as the writer. Paul says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. In Timothy our brother, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ who is, who are in Colossae, grace to you and peace from God, our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. 
And that's it. He says in verses one and two, he says, Paul, this is Paul who was on the Damascus road. His name was Saul. Jesus spoke to him on the Damascus road. He's no longer Saul. Now he's Paul. And because he's Paul now, he has a new message. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you, God wants to change your heart. He wants to change your message. He wants to change your mannerism. Whenever God comes in contact with you, you can never be the same. Yes. Once you give your life to Jesus, you can never, ever, ever be the same. When, when you come face to face with God, when, you, when God really touches your heart, when God really changes, when God really circumcises your heart, you can never be the same. Matter of fact, God gives you a new name. Your, man, your name may have been Joe Blow, but now your name is Servant. When God sees us and God sees us for who we are and he wants us to come on into his kingdom, he says, come on in, my good and faithful servant. I want to know if God is going to call you his good and faithful servant. But in order for you to be, be told good and faithful servant, you must have to do good first. That's right. Well done, my faithful servant. In order to be told well done, you must do well. In order to receive this, this great standing ovation, in order to receive this great salutation, you need to understand you don't get a well done from God unless you have done well. You got you to do well in order to get a well done for God. So the Apostle Paul's name is changed. And now this word apostle means a messenger, a spokesman, a delegate, one who was sent. This word apostle, the, the word apostle means a messenger, a spokesman, a delegate, one who was sent. It reminds me, it reminds me on a daily basis that there are some who were sent and there were some who just went. Mm -hmm. My question tonight is, did God send you or you just went? So the apostle Paul, is, he represents one who was, who was sent. He was sent to, to help churches, to organize churches, to set up churches. He says that I'm an apostle out of due season. If Paul is an apostle out of due season, why do we have modern day apostles now? Are people just calling themselves apostles? Are people claiming themselves to be apostles? I always wanted to ask the question, uh, what experience did you have to go through to become an apostle? Paul had an experience with Jesus. His, his disciples walked with Jesus. They, they were sent out by Jesus. They saw Jesus in the flesh. Paul says, I'm an apostle, but I'm an apostle out of due season. I'm an apostle after God was calling apostles. So how am I seeing apostles in the 21st century? If Paul declares that I'm an apostle out of due season. Paul, an apostle of, of Jesus Christ. Jesus, the son of God. Jesus, the savior of mankind. I'm an apostle of Jesus Christ. Let me tell you, if you are a messenger, you have to make sure you are a messenger for the right person. Because if you're not a messenger for the right person, then your message will cause you your very life. I'm so glad. I'm so glad. I'm so glad that I, I, I'm a messenger for the right person. I oftentimes look at the look at the news and I see the young lady who's smart, I'm sure, came out of a major Ivy League school stand, and she tries to make excuses for everything that the modern day president says. And she she took she took an oath and she said to American people, she said, one thing I won't do, I won't lie to you. And she's been lying ever since. Every time the president does something that's, that, that blows our mind, that we should already expect, she has to come behind him and make excuse for it. In the middle of a pandemic, she got to say stuff like, 
oh, the president was just jiving. Well, it's not time to jive now. The president was just joking. It's not time to joke right now. Right. Nearly 150,000 people have already died. And she's talking about, he, 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 just, he didn't really mean that. He was just playing around. I'm saying to you today, if you're going to be a messenger, be careful who you're carrying the message on behalf of. That's not good English. But be careful who, who, who you're carrying the message on behalf of because you need to make sure that you carry the message for God. Paul says right here that I'm an apostle. I am a messenger. I'm a spokesperson. I'm a delegate. I was sent by Jesus. Who is Jesus? The son of God, the savior of mankind, the incarnate God, the incarnated God, Yeshua, Jesus. I am the incarnate God or the incarnate God. I am the, I am the one, this Jesus that we're talking about, I'm the one who possessed the hyperstatic union as one of my characteristics. In other words, I'm just as much God as God and just as much man as man. I'm just reading the first two verses, the first two verses. Jesus Christ, the son of God, the savior of mankind, the incarnate God, you're sure I'm the Christ. He says I'm the Christ. Says I'm, I'm, I'm called by the Christ. This word Christ means the Messiah, mm -hmm. the anointed one, the Christ, the anointed one. He says, look at, look at verse number one. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God. The word will means the desire, the pleasure. In the purpose. The Apostle Paul says to us today that what we need to understand that, that I am coming to you through Jesus Christ by the will of God, at the pleasure of God, by the will of God, by the desire of God, by the will of God, because of the purpose of God. I am coming to you for none other than the purpose of of God himself. The problem with some of us when we take a message, we want to live out our own purpose. We have to live out the purpose of God. We have to live out the purpose of God with the pleasure of God in mind. We have to live out the purpose of God with the desire of God in mind. You see, when you're a messenger for somebody, you need to understand that you're a messenger to carry out the message of the messenger, of the, the person who's giving the message. We just we we are just conduit. We we are just we we are just instruments that God uses to get his word across. And let me just share with you, none of us qualify, none of us are good enough, none of us are, are decent enough to carry God's word. God just uses us because he is gracious, because he is merciful, because he is the amazing God. God just keeps using us. So when, when God is using us, we need to understand that we need to do it by the will of God, by the mercy of God, by the desire of God, by the, by the purpose of God, and by the, the pleasure of God. That's why we're called. This same God, he says, he says, by the will of God and Timothy, our brother. Timothy is his, his companion. Timothy is his traveling companion. He is known as the son in the ministry of Paul. The God, the word God is Theos God, the supreme deity. He is the exceeding one. God, he is the triune God. He is the magistrate. He is the final judge. This God, I, I, don't, want, I don't want this God mad at me. I don't want this God discontented with me. This the old God, this supreme deity, this God, the, the, ex, the exceeding God, this triune God, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, he is the great magistrate. He is the final judge. This is God. Thank God for just being God. I'm so glad that God is God and we're not God. I'm so glad that God is God and you are not God. 
I'm so glad that, that God is God and I'm not God. Thank God for just being God. He is a merciful God. Every time I think about God, whether he gives me what I want or not, I realize that he's been merciful to me. I should have been. I deserve to be dead and gone. But God is merciful to me. He's given me chance after chance after chance. He is a merciful God. He is the final judge. He is the great magistrate. He's the final judge. You know, folk going to judge you. Folk going to judge you. You know, young people say, don't judge me. Let me tell you, don't worry about me judging you. <laughs> Concern yourself with whether or not God has good things to say about you. He is the final, the final judge. He says, verse number two, to the saints. He is writing this letter to the saints. Those who are holy. Those who are morally blameless. The saints, those who are pure. Now, none of us are perfect in the form that we see perfectness. But when Paul writes this letter to the saints at Colossae, he is saying to the saints at Colossae, I'm writing to you because of your faith. I'm writing to you because you have shown yourself to be blameless, morally, and to be holy and set aside. I am writing to you who are pure in heart. Oh, Paul's writing to us. We, we throw the word saint around. We throw the word saint around all the time. And, and this word saint means that, that you are pure. You are you're blameless. And when, when we talk about the word blameless, we don't, need, we don't mean that you don't have a fault. But we, we mean that your character is blameless. I'm so glad that some of the New Beginning Church members can say, well, that's not his character. He wouldn't do that. I'm so glad that some of my friends can say, that's not his character. He wouldn't do that. Yes. That's not what he would do. It, are, are any of your friends able to say that's not your character? Are any of your friends able to say that you're blameless? Any of your friends say that you're pure? Are you a morally, morally holy? Your morals are in order? The reason why people walk up and kill people at point blank range these days is because they have no morals. Yes. They have no conscience. Mm -hmm. The way, the reason why, reason why leaders, governors, and presidents can say, "Go on, do what you want to do. Uh, it's okay," and they they know that you're going to kill somebody or you're going to be killed is because they have no heart for the people. Yes. They they don't care how many of us die or live. Matter of fact, the more of us that die. <laughs> Before November, the better it is. We need to understand. We need to follow those who with character, who has character, whose character is blameless. So when Paul uses the word saint, he's saying, those of you who are morally blameless, those of you who are holy and pure. Says to in verse number two, Philippians, I'm sorry, Colossians chapter one, verse number two to the saints, those who I'm writing to, and the faithful brethren. Word faithful means trustworthy. You can, you can depend on them. They're, they're trustworthy. You can depend on them. When I was a boy, my granddad and dad and all of them used to shake hands with a brother and walk away, and whatever they shook hands on, they were, they were faithful to deliver. If they came over, if he was a contractor and he was going to put the roof on the house, they didn't use a contract. They would shake hands. Say, okay, I'll be here at 8 o'clock in the morning. They didn't have to exchange money or anything. They were, they were trustworthy. Mm -hmm. men, men in my days as a boy, they would be trustworthy men. They, they would give you your word and they would carry it out to the end. Yes. And if you tried to give them a deposit, they said, don't worry about it. I trust you. And you wouldn't have to give them anything until the job is finished. Let me tell you, nowadays, if you got a contractor, the contract doesn't mean anything. Mm -hmm. They can get the contract, they can get the down payment, and you will never see them again. Right. Paul is saying that I'm writing to you who are faithful 
those of you who are trustworthy, those of you who've been faithful to the Lord and have been faithful to the ministry. Have you been faithful to the ministry? Sometimes I look at people when they, they can go anywhere, grocery store, doctor's office, they can go anywhere they want to go. And when they go those places, they're always on time. They give the doctor the money, the, the, the cashier the money. They, 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 are, they are trustworthy when it comes to everything but the Lord's business. Mm -hmm. God is looking for a church who is faithful. There are some people right today, we're not having church right now in, in a church building, but we're having church online. They are not even faithful to being online on time. God is looking for saints who are trustworthy, who are faithful to the cause, those who are blameless and who are pure. The same people that was telling us five years ago um, God is working on me, t still telling me five years later, God is working on them. And, and I agree, God is working on you. I know God is working on you, but God should not be working on the same thing today as he was five years ago. Change must happen. Transformation must happen. Deliverance must take place. The problem is the same people are having the same struggles over and over again. Paul says, grow up. He says, I wanted, to, I wanted to give you meat. I couldn't. You would have choked on it. I'm still feeding you milk. Grow up. Don't have the same excuses over and over and over again. Grow up. Now, here we are online, and we're having church, and there are some who are not faithful to the online broadcast, and they were the same ones that were not faithful to the in-person preaching. Yes. Oh, Lord, have mercy. God is looking for the faithful, those who are yes. trustworthy. The question is, can God trust you? Can God trust you with his his air? Can God trust you with his, his breath? Can God trust you with the heartbeat? Can God trust you to do the right thing at the right time? Can God trust you even though we're not in the local church? Can he trust you to stay in touch with him through prayer, through preaching, through, through Bible study, through home Bible study, through teaching your children? Can God trust you? There are folk that God can't trust. And they say they are Christians, but God can't trust them. Paul, Paul says in verse number, number two that to the saints and the faithful brethren, the believers, this word brethren means the believers, the faithful brethren, the followers, the followers of Christ, the, the, the fellow believers. He's saying the fellow believers are, who are at Colossae, Colossae. Colossae, Colossae is a place in Asia Minor, about 100 miles east of Ephesus. Colossae. Paul is said to have never visit, visited Colossae, but he's writing this letter because he's heard word that they are getting caught up in all kinds of devilment. They're getting caught up in false doctrine. And you know, even today in the 21st century, we find folk, when a new doctrine comes out, phew, they shoot to it. Because they're not concerned of basic, fundamental Bible teaching gospel. Yes. Even preachers have gotten caught up into this false doctrine because they cannot maintain a standard. They believe that they got to continue to find something new in order to excite the people. Let me tell you, preacher said to me, man, you're going to have to, if you're going to fill your church up, you're going to have to stop preaching that old gospel you're preaching. But Romans chapter, chapter 1 verse 16 says, I ought not be ashamed of the gospel, yes. for it is the power of God unto salvation mm -hmm. to everybody, the Jew and the Greek. It is the power of God unto salvation. Let me just share with you, my brother, if I can't preach this gospel, I will not preach any other gospel. I'd rather God close my mouth and why my mouth shut, shut, shut if I preach any other gospel 
For the word of God says, let him be a curse that preaches any other gospel. That word a curse means let him be damned if he preaches any other gospel. And he was saying to me that I need to stop preaching. I need to preach foreign, uh, pre preach current events. Current events don't save us, but the gospel saves us. Yes, the gospel of Jesus Christ is what saves us. So Paul preaches and teaches to this church at, at Colossae, and he says, grace to you in peace from God our Father. Now Paul used, even though we're in the New Testament, and we know that the New Testament is presented in Greek and the Old Testament is presented in Hebrew. I said the Old Testament is presented in Hebrew. The New Testament is presented in Greek. That's a good, good, good test question. And even though the, the, we are in the New Testament, Paul uses both Hebrew and Greek in his greeting. First of all, he says grace. This is, a, this is a Greek greeting. He says, grace to you. This is a Greek greeting. This word grace means favor, means thanks worthy. It means to be accepted. This word grace is, Greek, is a Greek greeting. This is what those who, who are Greeks would walk up and say, grace to you. But then he says, peace, which is a Hebrew greeting. He says, quietness, this word peace means quietness, oneness, rest, and wholeness. This word peace here, peace means quietness, to be set at one, oneness, to have rest, to have wholeness. So he walks up and he greets them as he does over 80 times throughout scripture using Greek and Hebrew, the Greek greeting and the Hebrew greeting, and he says, grace and peace. He says it's from God, the supreme one. This grace and peace is from God, the supreme, the exceeding one, the triune God, the final judge. He says, grace and peace from God the Father, from the Father himself. God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. The word Lord means supreme in authority. The word Lord means master. The word Lord means controller. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Savior of mankind, Christ the Messiah, the anointed one. Paul is saying here to the Greek and the Hebrew, <laughs> grace and peace to you. And if you're going to have quietness, if you're going to have stillness, if you're going to have favor, it must come through God the Father, <laughs> Jesus Christ our Lord. He says, if you're going to be complete, if you're going to be whole, you got to make sure that you have the Lord with you. Because Jesus, the Lord, is supreme in authority. There's no authority above his authority. Yes. It's the name of Jesus. It is the, the name of Jesus, the Lord, that gives us our authority. And throughout the book of Colossians, you will find out that he paints the picture of Jesus as our Lord, our supreme authority, as our master, as our controller. My question to you tonight, as the door of the church is open, will you allow Jesus to be your Lord? Will you allow him to be your master? Will you allow him to be your savior? Will you allow him to be supreme in authority? The door of the church is open. The invitation is extended. As Paul would say to the church at Colossae, Forget about all this false doctrine. Forget about Gnosticism. Forget about mysticism. Even forget about Judaism. Come to Jesus. 
and trust him to be your Lord and your Savior. Allow him to be supreme in authority. You can do that today if you just trust Jesus as your personal Savior. Believing that he's the Son of God. And out of obedience unto God, he gave his life as a ransom for you and me. You can invite him into your life right now. Just join me in this simple prayer. And the only thing I'm going to ask you to do is repeat after me and say, Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you died for my sins and rose from the dead. Come into my life and make me a new person. Will you join me in that prayer right now? Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you died for my sins. I believe that you rose from the dead. Now come into my life and make me a new person. Thank you for saving my soul. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and thank God. We believe if you prayed that prayer that you're now born again and you're on your way to heaven whenever you die. If you're watching me by live broadcast and you need a church home or you're in between church homes or you don't have a church home, I recommend this one, the New Beginning Church, where you can become a follower of Christ and have a place to serve him. If you've received Jesus as your Savior during this broadcast, please inbox me. If you want to be a member of the New Beginning Church, please inbox me so we can communicate one with the other and you can get to know Jesus as your personal Savior and your Lord, the one who controls the one who is supreme in authority, Jesus, the Lord himself. Thank you so much for joining us during our Bible study. Thank you for, for joining us to, and we all realize that Jesus is the supreme authority. He is the one who, who is our controller. God the Father is the one who's the final judge. He's the magistrate. He is the one. God the Father is the one who has the last say, to say so. We understand tonight that, that the Holy Spirit doesn't hit us. He dwells in us. And when we receive Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ comes in and the Holy Spirit resides in us. And he teaches us and he blesses us. Thank you so much. It is now offering time. It is time to give to the Lord. It is time to give to the Lord through tithes, offering, and sacrificial gifts. It is time to give to the Lord Jesus Christ through tithes, offering, and sacrificial gifts. You can do so tonight in three forms. You can do so by giving to our cash app. Our cash tag is NBC Souls. Cash tag NBC Souls. You can give by cash app through cash tag dollar sign NBC Souls. If you want to give by mail, you can mail your offering to the New Beginning Church, P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas 77459. P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas 77459. You can give by mail. And the third way that you can give is by Zelle. You can give by Zelle by the email lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. You can give by Zelle. Again, thank you for joining us here for Bible study tonight. We, we meet every Wednesday night at 7.20 p.m. Thank you for joining us here tonight. Also, every Sunday morning at 9 a.m., you can continue to join us for Sunday school every Sunday morning at 9 a.m., and you can join us for our worship service every Sunday morning at 1045 a.m., 1045 a.m. Thank you much for joining us. 
Let us pray for our nation, pray for our world, and pray for each other that God will continue to bless us, continue to walk with us, continue to be our leader and our guide. Pray for our president of the United States of America. Let's don't talk about him. Let's pray about him and watch what God does in the middle of it. Bless this nation, Lord, that the Lord will continue to give us what we need and not just what we want. Continue to pray for your church home. Pray for for your family members. We're praying for the Holman Street Baptist Church and that God will strengthen them in times like these. We're praying that the Holman Street Baptist Church be strengthened tremendously. That's the church where I began my first ministry as a preacher back in 1992. We want to pray and lift that church before them, before the Lord, as the Lord lead and guide this church in the death of, of their pastor. We want to thank God for this church. This church has meant much to me and much to many. So let's continue to lift that church before you. Those of you who are members of the New Beginning Church, we will begin our prayer time by Zoom on fourth Tuesdays and by, by phone, by uh, conference phone on second Tuesday. So our first prayer night will be, be July the 13th by telephone, by conference. I'll get that information out to you. We want to come together and pray and, and lift the, the people before the Lord and lift our concerns before the Lord. Let's meet by, by conference phone on July 13th. We want to come together in prayer and ask the Lord to bless us and uh, bless uh, what we're going through. And we want to ask the Lord to kill off this pandemic. We want to ask the Lord to kill off COVID-19. We want to ask the Lord to demolish the coronavirus, that we will have relief and that God will continue to bless us physically, spiritually, financially, and God will restore us. God has shown us that man can't do it. We need God to do it. Again, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for being a part of the New Beginning Church service. Look forward to seeing you and hearing from you uh, Sunday for Sunday school at 9 a.m., Sunday worship at 1045, and also Wednesday night at 720. Thank you again for, for being a blessing to the New Beginning Church. Let's go to God in prayer. Father God, we thank you now. We bless your name. We thank you for your mercy and your grace. We thank you for this, your word. We thank you for the Apostle Paul and the words that he has penned. We thank you, Lord, that we are servants of the Most High God. We are saints. And we are set aside for you. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that Jesus Christ is the supreme one in authority. We ask you to bless us to reverence him. Bless us, Father God, that we will always acknowledge him. And bless us that we will always hold to him. It's in Jesus' name we pray and we ask it all. Amen. And thank God. Please, ma'am, please, sir, read verses 1 through 8 for next week's Bible study. Verses 1 through 8, Colossians chapter 1, verses 1 through 8. As you know, I try to teach by pericopes. Pericopes are one key thought within a group of verses. So the next pericope pericope stops at verse number eight, according to my Bible. So we'll be reading and studying and, and looking over as well as our daily reading for our Sunday school. Please look at your Sunday school daily reading and Philippians, I mean Colossians. We just finished Philippians. Colossians chapter one, verses one through eight. God bless you and God keep you is our prayer. Thank you so much for joining us and being a part of our service. God bless you.